This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson three from the series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled The Everlasting Covenant, ready for teaching on October 16, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word. We thank you that each week, each day, we can open it and find treasures there that will bless us individually, but also help with our salvation, help with our relationship with those about us, and help us to be able to show your love to the world. But most of all, to help us understand you. We pray for wherever people are listening at this time, Lord, whether in the Philippines or Dubai or the United States or Tanzania or the Virgin Islands or Japan or Australia or Peru or multiple other countries. We just pray that wherever people are listening, that you will bless them. Bless us with our families as well, dear Lord, and in our own personal witness, may we always be able to walk with you and show others your love by the way we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Let's read that again. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Notice the everlasting gospel. Everlasting as in always existing, as in having always been there, as in having been promised to us in Christ Jesus before time began, as it says in Titus 1 and verse 2. Hence, it's no wonder that the Bible talks at other times about the everlasting covenant. As we read in our memory verse, Genesis 17 verse 7, but we also see in Isaiah 24 verse 5, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. And Ezekiel 16, verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. And Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Because the essence of the gospel is covenant, and the essence of the covenant is the gospel. God, out of his saving grace and love, offers you a salvation that you do not deserve and cannot possibly earn, and you, in response, love him back, and as it says in Mark 12.30, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. A love that is made manifest by obedience to his law, as we read in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This week, we will look at the idea of the covenant as expressed in the book of Deuteronomy, where the covenant and all that it entails is made manifest. Sunday, October 10, The Covenant and the Gospel All through the Bible, the covenant and the gospel appear together. Though the idea of covenant existed before the nation of Israel, for example, the Noahic covenant, and though that covenant promise was made before the nation of Israel existed, it was expressed prominently through God's interaction with his people, starting with their fathers, the patriarchs. And even from the start, the central truth of the covenant was the gospel. 
salvation by faith alone. Read Genesis 12, 1-3, Genesis 15, 5-18, and Romans 4, 1-5. What was the covenant promise made to Abram, later Abraham, and how is the gospel revealed in that covenant promise? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Genesis 15, beginning at verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all those to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But In the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I will give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, and Romans 4, beginning at verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Abraham believed God, believed in God's promises to him, and thus he was justified before God. This declaration, however, was not cheap grace. Abraham sought to uphold his end of the covenant by obedience, such as seen in Genesis 22 at Mount Moriah. All this even though his faith is accounted for righteousness, as we've just read in Romans 4.5. That's why, centuries later, Paul would use Abraham as the exemplar of what it means to live by the covenant promises God had made with his people. This theme echoes throughout the Bible. Paul brought it up another time in Galatians 3.6, where he again quotes Genesis 15 verse 6 about Abraham's faith being accounted to him for righteousness. And he refers back to the promise first made to Abram about all nations being blessed in his seed, as we read in Galatians 3, 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. 
The covenant promises are made to all, Jew and Gentile, who are of faith, it said in Galatians 3.7, and thus who are justified by faith without the deeds of the law, however much they are obligated because of the covenant to obey the law. Even when Jeremiah talks about the new covenant, he does so in the context of the law in Jeremiah 31.33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Reflecting the language that goes back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 12. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. So to finish today, how does the covenantal idea of the law and the gospel together fit so perfectly with the three angels' messages of Revelation 14? God's final warning message to the world. Monday, October 11, The Covenant and Israel Deuteronomy 9 verse 5 reads, It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 27. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, do not look on the stubbornness of this people, or on their wickedness, or their sin. How is the reality of the covenantal promises made manifest in this verse? Here too the covenant of grace appears. God worked for them despite the constant mistakes. This surely has to be how the gospel works today as well. And it was because of the promise made to the fathers that God's grace was given to their future generations. In Moses dealing with the people to whom the covenantal promises were given as a whole, he often referred back to the covenantal promises made to the patriarchs. Read Exodus 2, verse 24, Exodus 6, 8, and Leviticus 26, verse 42. What is being said here that helps show how the covenantal promises work? Exodus 2 and verse 24. And that reads, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And Exodus chapter 6 and verse 8. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. In Leviticus 26, verse 42, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham I will remember. I will remember the land. The Exodus from Egypt the great symbol of God's saving grace, also was based on the covenant the Lord had made to their fathers. That is, even before the beneficiaries of the covenant were born, the promises were made in their behalf. Thus, through no merit of their own, to say the least, they received the promised deliverance, which God did for them through the miracles and events of the Exodus. Of course, things don't end there. They went from Egypt to where? Yes, Sinai, where the covenant with them was officially established, as we read in Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations 
of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbour's. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and when they saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear. For God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar on earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. And central to that covenant was gospel and the law, the Ten Commandments, which they were called upon to obey, a manifestation of their saving relationship with the Lord, who already had redeemed them, the gospel. Hence, again and again in Deuteronomy, they were called to obey that law as their part of the covenant, which had been ratified at Sinai. So to finish the day, what role should the law of God play in our lives today, we who have been saved by grace? And why is the law so crucial to our experience with God? Tuesday, October 12, the Book of the Covenant. Though the idea of covenant, beret in Hebrew, to describe God's relationship with his people is found all through the Bible, this word appears so often in Deuteronomy that Deuteronomy has been called the Book of the Covenant. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. What is happening here that helps to show how central the idea of covenant, or beret, is to the book of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. And the Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain, he said. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honour your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbour's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbour's. Not long after the children of Israel were redeemed from Egypt, God established the covenant with them at Sinai, just before they were supposed to enter the promised land. Then, after a forty-year detour, just before they were again to enter the promised land, which was a central part of the covenantal promise, as we see in Exodus 12.25 and Genesis 12.7 Through the mouth of Moses, the Lord again gives them the Ten Commandments, a way to re-emphasize just how important it was for them to renew their covenant obligations as well. Genesis 12.7 reads, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And Exodus 12.25 it will come to pass, when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep his service. Yes, the Lord was going to fulfil his covenantal promises to them. Now, though, they are obligated to uphold their end of the deal. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone, Deuteronomy 4.13. He did it at Sinai, and now he was doing it again in Moab, just before they were to take the land promised to them through the promise made to the fathers centuries earlier, a manifestation of the everlasting covenant that preceded even the existence of the world. As we read in Desire of Ages, page 834, before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. Read Deuteronomy 5 verse 3 again. How do we make sense of this verse? Deuteronomy 5, verse 3, The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. What was Moses saying to them? Most likely Moses was emphasizing the fact that their fathers were now gone, and the wonderful covenantal promises made to the fathers were now being made to them. This could have been Moses' way of letting them know that they should not mess up as the previous generation had done. The promises and obligations are now theirs.
Wednesday, October 13, His Special People. It's hard for us today to grasp much of what the ancient world was like at the time in which Israel was wandering the wilderness. If whole empires have come and gone, with only ruins, if that remaining, what can we know of many of the smaller pagan nations that lived in the same area as Israel did? Not a whole lot. But we do know one thing. These people were steeped in paganism, polytheism and some utterly degrading practices which included child sacrifice. Try to imagine just how degrading and evil a culture and religion would be that would do that to their own children and do so in the name of some god. No wonder, again and again, all through the history of ancient Israel, the Lord had warned his people against following the practices of the nations around them, as in Deuteronomy 18.9, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. And that's because God had called out this nation for a special purpose. By having entered into the covenant with God, they were to be a special people, a witness to the world of the God who created the heaven and the earth, the only God. Read Deuteronomy 26 verses 16 to 19. How is the covenant relationship between God and Israel summed up in these verses? How should their faithfulness to the covenant be manifested in the kind of people they were to become? What lessons can we take from there for ourselves as well? Deuteronomy 26, beginning at verse 16. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made, in praise, in name, and in honour, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. How fascinating! that Moses begins these four verses with the words, This day, as in right now again. God commands you to do these things. Moses repeats the idea in verse 17. He had been commanding them all along to do these things. It's as if Moses is telling them they need to commit at this very moment again to be the faithful, holy and special people, which is truly the central reason for their existence as the covenant nation. They were the only nation who knew the true God and knew the truth about this God and how he wanted them to live. In a real sense, they not only had present truth, but they also were in their own way to embody that truth until Jesus, the truth himself, as we read in John 14 verse 6, was to come. And John 14 verse 6 reads, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so to finish the day, Why is the idea of this day committing to God and to his covenant requirements relevant even to us this day? Thursday, October 14, Other Images Biblical scholarship has long recognised the similarities between Israel's covenant with God and other covenantal agreements between kingdoms. This parallel shouldn't be surprising. The Lord was simply working with his people in terms that they could understand. At the same time, the idea of a covenant, a legal agreement between two parties with rules and stipulations and regulations, can seem so cold and so formal. 
Though that element must indeed exist, God is the lawgiver, it's not broad enough to encompass the depth and breadth and the kind of relationship God wanted with his people. Hence, other images are used in Deuteronomy to help portray the same idea as the covenant between God and Israel, but just to give it added dimensions. Read Deuteronomy 8 verse 5, 14 verse 1 and 32 verse 6 and 18 to 20. What kind of imagery is used here and how could this help reveal the relationship God wanted with his people? Deuteronomy 8 verse 5. You shall know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. And Deuteronomy 14 verse 1, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourself nor shave the front of your head for the dead. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 6, Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought you? Has he not made you and established you? And Deuteronomy 32, verses 18 to 20. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful, and have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. And then read Deuteronomy 4, verse 20, Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. What imagery is used here, and how too does this help reveal the kind of relationship God wanted with his people? So, chapter 4, verse 20 reads, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people, an inheritance as you are this day. And chapter 32, verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. In each case, There is the idea of family, which ideally should be the closest, tightest and most loving of bonds. God has always wanted this kind of relationship with his people. Even after their shameful rejection of Jesus during the time of the cross, Jesus said to the two Marys after he had been resurrected, In Matthew 28 verse 10, Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Even as the resurrected Christ, he referred to the disciples as my brethren, an example of love and the grace that flows from love for those who certainly didn't deserve it. That's essentially what the relationship between God and humanity has always been, grace and love given to the undeserving. And so to finish today, what kind of relationship do you have with God? How can you deepen it and learn to love him while at the same time understanding your covenant obligation to obey his law? Why are these two ideas not contradictory but complementary? Friday, October 15. From the Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1077, in the Ellen G. White comments, we read The spirit of bondage is engendered by seeking to live in accordance with legal religion through striving to fulfill the claims of the law in our own strength. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel preached to Abraham, through which he had hope, was the same gospel that is preached to us today, through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and finisher of our faith. End of quote. And from the same author, from the Desire of Ages, page 834, 
Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge Christ has fulfilled. When upon the cross he cried out, It is finished, he addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. Now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. As we read in John 19.30, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And John 17.24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation foundation of the world. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, dwell on the idea that even before the foundation of the world, the Father and Son had united in a covenant to redeem us if the race fell. Why should that be so encouraging to us? What should this teach us about how much God wants us to be saved into his kingdom? Two, as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in what ways should we fulfil the role that ancient Israel should have fulfilled in its time? How can we learn to avoid the mistakes that they made? And three, why are the Gospel and the promises of the Gospel so central to the whole idea of the New Covenant? What texts can you find in the New Testament that show how the law and obedience to the law were not abolished under the New Covenant as commonly taught by other Christians? Why do you think so many Christians say that the Gospel nullifies the need to keep the Ten Commandments? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Good After Beirut Blast, and it's by Kathy Lichtenwalter. I barely noticed the first thud and shudder. We'd had breezes all afternoon that rattled our front door, but the second unfamiliar thud shudder was unmistakable. In a politically fragile world, I knew the possibilities well. Fireworks, a machine gun, a car bomb, a fighter jet flying over. While nothing had ever involved me personally, I had learned that every sound has a meaning, sometimes tragic. I thought nothing of stepping out onto the front porch to investigate. From my hilly outpost above the campus of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Middle East University, I looked across the sprawling city of Beirut below, past the port and toward the Mediterranean Sea. I noticed the clouds, a mushroom it seemed, dispersing in high-speed flourishes across the sky overhead. Not normal, not good. I stepped further out onto the porch just as a massive explosion enveloped me. A wall of wind with dust and debris lifted me forcefully and threw me back into the house. I grabbed the door but couldn't get a grip to close it. The force seemed to blow straight through the walls. The window curtains twisted crazily around me. I could hardly stand. I wanted to look out the window, but I didn't know if more was coming. I wanted to be safe, but where was safety? So I paced the hallway, my hands shaking. I started breathing again. Everything was eerily silent, normal. Minutes later, Osman called. I'd given him an online violin lesson just before the explosion. Now he was calling back, his eyes wild, his face sweaty, his phone jerking around to show me the destruction of his family's tiny apartment. It is all broken, he said. All broken, miss. That wasn't new to him. His family had been bombed out of Syria six years earlier. 
For him, the August 2020 warehouse explosion that killed at least 200 wasn't his broken apartment. It was the familiar cycle of loss. It's a cycle I can't break. I can't numb the pain, reclaim the losses, rebuild a country. Nobody can. But we are not helpless. We are not victims. We stand in the presence of God, interceding for what is beyond our power to change and giving him permission to defy the evil that is flexing and fuming. Good can come out of this. Let God's name be honoured through my life on our Middle East University campus for dear Lebanon and into the uttermost parts of our reeling world. Kathy Lichtenwalter works for the Tent Making Initiative at the Middle East and North Africa Union. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach in large cities across the 1040 window among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org and there's a lovely photo of the smiling Kathy Lichtenwalter just to our left here. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.